So, um, those of you who have seen me uh, speak in the past would now think, well, this is the point at which John puts a lot of numbers up. But I've changed post-pandemic, okay? And we're going to do it today uh, with pictures, okay? So many of you, uh, and there are a number of uh, young people uh, in the room, that's people who are looking forward to their 50th birthday, uh, haven't experienced inflation uh, in the past. Uh, you think you've experienced inflation, uh, but you haven't. And now you're just for about the first time in your life uh, going to experience inflation, uh, which is above 2%. Uh, there are a number of people in this room who think that inflation is above 2%. It's an absolute tragedy and the world is going to end. By the end of this year, we're going to be looking at inflation uh, in the United Kingdom around 10%, and we see that inflation uh, across the globe. Okay, uh, inflation, interestingly, that is being that is being driven by cost pressures, not demand, dragging uh, prices up. So what we see is uh, fractures in global supply chains, increasing our costs, uh, input costs going up, be that uh, fuel costs, uh, be that food costs. Uh, driving prices uh, aggressively in a way that they haven't uh, in the past. Okay, The danger is then that what happens is because of a cost of living crisis that consumption in our economy, which drives a lot of the UK, North American, Western European uh, advanced economies, consumption is you know, 70, 80 percent of total demand, so that's household consumption, uh, will decline and that will drive us uh, into recession. Um, I'm a little bit, um, any of you who've heard me speak recently, um, I'm not so sure that the, 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 suits, uh, the, the dooms sayers who are, who are suggesting that we will go uh, into recession at the end of this year have actually got it right. I think what we'll see is a significant reduction uh, in growth. Whether we get two, two consecutive quarters of negative growth, uh, I'm not so sure about that. And why am I not so sure about that? Because something is going on in our labour market uh, that is not normal, okay? Or at least it's not normal uh, for economists uh, like me. So you see that we are hiring job, join us, vacancies, welcome uh, picture at the bottom. We have a situation where um, employment is very, very high and unemployment is very, very low. And those of you who... And, th and this is true of many, many uh, advanced economists. So we have a situation where labour markets are incredibly tight. Okay? Now, in the past, that would have led to an acceleration in wages as the power of trade unions increased, and they used that power and tight labour markets to go in and ask for significant increases uh, in wages. Okay? What is actually happening uh, and there is more evidence of this, is the wage acceleration is actually coming from the buy side of the labour market. So it's not trade unions that are going in and asking for increases in wages. They are, but trade union power has been uh, reduced. It's actually on the buy side, it's employers going out in tight labour markets and accelerating wages in order that they can bid labour uh, into their organisation. So if wages accelerate, that's what's likely uh, to drive it. This then, if we go to the right-hand side of the slide, uh, starts to introduce a whole series of uh, ideas uh, that are coming back into favour. Um, and I included this because you're going to hear this stuff. Um, uh, I, we've not really heard it for about 40 years. So I'm listening to economists talking on the radio saying, what should the Bank of England be doing if we've got increases uh, in inflation of 10%? Because remember, the Bank of England is charged with keeping inflation at or around 2%. In fact, if it's plus or minus 1% uh, around their 2% target, they have to write a letter to the Chancellor explaining what they're doing about it and why uh, they think inflation will come back in to those bounds, okay? So obviously we're well outside those bounds and then the economists come on the radio and they say, the Bank of England should start to increase interest rates because it has to influence expectations. And everybody starts talking about this notion of rational expectations, which I haven't heard for 40 years. 
So if you go back to when I was an undergraduate, we were told that if the Chancellor comes in and announces that he's going to reduce inflation because there's a whole series of policies, that people will listen to that and develop a rational expectation that inflation is going to go down and they will limit their wage demands going forward. Okay? It's an absolute load of junk okay, and nonsense. Rational expectations do not work in that way. Don't believe me, believe Robert Schiller. Okay? Robert Schiller, the Nobel laureate, for sake of you know, full disclosure, whose major ta text is irrational, or, or sorry, exuberant uh, expectations, said that economists who adhere to rational expectations model of the world will never admit it, but a lot of what happens in markets is driven by pure stupidity, or rather inattention, misinformation about fundamentals. Okay, and an exaggerated focus on the stories that are currently circulating. So I don't think it is appropriate for the Bank of England to go in for significant interest rate increases. Please, somebody explain to me how the Bank of England increase in interest rates is going to cause the price of gas to go down, the global price of oil to go down, the global price of wheat to go down, because there is a war in the Ukraine. Okay? So all of this stuff is stuff that you're going to hear uh, a lot about. And then the last piece uh, in the labour market that we need to think about is the Great Resignation. So part of the problem that you have, frankly, is people of my age uh, leaving the labour market uh, because they can. Uh, I heard an economist last night saying that we're going to see an increase in disability claims. Okay? Uh, because people are leaving the labour market and they're going to claim benefits in order to fund it. I don't think that that's the case. I think what we're seeing is the end, the tail end of the defined benefits pension schemes. Okay? So essentially, you've got people of my age and slightly younger, I'll be 60 at my next birthday, okay, um, who now have defined benefits pension schemes, who've looked at the, the um, two years of the pandemic and said, enough. I'm cashing my pension in, I can afford to retire, and I'm going. And if you look at the statistics, it's the 55 to 60 year olds, okay? They're about 250,000, 260,000 of the 420,000 people who have exited the labour market post pandemic in the United Kingdom, okay? So we've got a lot of stuff that's going on in the background that you guys, you guys have to work in that environment, okay? And of course, as we get cost of living crisis, as we get the threat of inflation, the danger is in a sustainability context that the pressure comes on you guys to up the importance of price, to up the importance of reducing costs uh, in your supply chain, and to what extent does that operate uh, against the sustainability agenda in the minds uh, of, the, of the uneducated as far as this is concerned.